So my name is Fran Walsh and I'm the lay chaplain at Rice and Anthony School in Oxford. I'm also an RE teacher for Key Stage 3. So uh, this is a Catholic school um, and so the, the lay part is particularly important and particularly distinctive, I would say, to, to the role. So I'm an, a non, an unordained, I should say non, un, unordained, rather than non-ordained, unordained um, chaplain um, who has taken her vocation to, the, to lay ministry very seriously. Um, and so I am a person here who would support the sacramental life of the school, so the work of a priest that would come in. Um, I get involved in the pastoral care uh, system of the school, uh, offering one-to-one -one support, um, pastoral listening, not counselling as such, but, um, but, but, a, but a listening ear, a safe place, a listening ear for young people to come and speak to, either on their own or in small groups, working on particular issues and needs that they may have. Um, but then also someone to animate the faith life of the school, so to develop opportunities for young people to explore and deepen their faith, to um, take them on trips that will broaden their experience of what church might look like, um, to introduce them to faith, maybe for the very first time. We have a very low percentage of Catholics within the school community, and so young people are having their first faith experiences in this place. And, gently talking them through, introducing them to ideas and concepts perhaps they've never thought of before. That introduces very nicely the whole idea of spiritual development uh -huh. and the ethos of the school. So how do you as a chaplain contribute to that, evaluate it, and measure it, etc.? So the ethos of the school is central really. It forms the foundation under which everything happens within this school. The idea of being yourself, but also discerning your vocation. These two ideas um, are very central. We want um, our students here to understand who they are, but within the context of, of God who calls each one of us to a particular purpose. So I look for ways in which that can happen, um, and I think that complements perhaps the more educational focused side of school life. We want young people to leave here um, able to do the things that they want to do in their next steps, to develop gifts and talents, to have the opportunity and the choice to go where they want to, to do what they want to do. But the backdrop for that is that it has to be what is right for them and what God has called them to do. So there is this constant um, message to them that they have been created for a particular purpose and that the role of our school is to help them to discover what that is um, and to work in, in such a way that helps them to grow in those gifts and talents ready for the next stage of their life. Um, nobody I think really likes the idea of evaluating but actually when you have a, an experience of how positive it can be and what it can add to um, to the next time you do something, it suddenly becomes very meaningful. And within a Catholic context, uh, we have a very formal um, inspection process, um, and this sort of enforces the idea that we do stop after we do something, we meet together with those who are involved, and we go through some questions and ask ourselves, well, was faith central to that event? Were there big gaps? Was um, scripture important? Was the environment important? Um, and then what went well and what would be even better that we did next time? So we're constantly asking out these questions. So uh, what, went well, what went well and even better if? And so when we come to then looking at doing an event again for the following year, we'll get out that form and, and look at what the staff have said, what the students have said. So I keep by my desk a little rota um, a list of all the tutor groups and what I've asked them to evaluate. So no tutor group um, is, is we, don't, we don't just hear from one particular year group, one particular tutor group, but constantly different groups of people. This is an all through school, so we ensure that we get the views of the prep school, so the littlest, as well as the older ones as well. And we refer to these when we are planning for the future. Yeah, so... Um, in a Catholic school, RE is very central, and so young people will be introduced to, um, to religious ideas uh, right from when they start all the way through to when they leave the school. And some will see that as an academic pursuit, but others will take that more to heart and want to explore that in more detail. 
um, and make a stronger link between a belief and practice. Well, what does that belief look like in their everyday life? And so I'm a person they can come to, as well as their RE teacher, and for some of them I am their RE teacher, um, but to talk about what, what does that look like? How does that belief impact the way somebody lives their life? And often, as we're aware, um, there's an element of sacrifice. Like, well, that, you know, that feels like you're giving up something or not doing something, or there's a restriction on you. Um, but actually, then we're, we're looking at well, what, how, how can that seeming uh, restriction actually give life and create um, opportunities for a flourishing faith, rather than something that's negative, but something that's positive. I think young people don't necessarily see that in today's society. Restrictions are seen as, as bad, negative. Everyone should be able to do what they want when they want to do it. But maybe they need that help to make that connection or how is that restriction actually life-giving for me? And, and so that, I would say, would be the, the start of many conversations with young people. They're very curious, um, wanting to know, well, why, why would you do that? What are the benefits of doing that? And that, of course, opens up the door to them talking more deeply about, um, about faith and faith forming. We'll do this in a, in a range of ways. That might be a young person coming to me as an individual, or it might be a, lesson, a question in class that then spills out over um, into the lunchtime, or you know, we might go for a walk around the grounds and talk. We might pray together about a particular need, and we're looking at uh, suffering or the needs of the world, Catholic social teaching that might bring something up for a young person they want to pray about and, but don't know how to pray. So it really is um, student-led, I would say, here, and we respond to the needs that, that they present to us. But also, um, I guess, this idea of discipleship or catechesis, that's the word we perhaps use, um, comes through the ordinary structure of the day. So assemblies, for example, these will often be based on the gospel that was uh, presented at Mass. The, the Sunday before. Um, it might be a liturgical season that we want to unpack and help them to understand. So whether that's Advent or Lent or a particular feast in the church's year. Um, and we would take those opportunities to work through the normal structure of the day and, um, and animate a faith um, experience through them. And then an opportunity for dialogue afterwards. There are some young people that are going to church and uh, wanting to look for ways to disciple their own friends and wanting to be more actively involved in the chaplaincy and the faith life of the school. They perhaps want to run a Bible study for their group and they want to reach out to somebody whose lifestyle perhaps they're um, uncomfortable with. And again, the chaplain can support a young person in their own personal mission as they see it and to help them respond to the needs of the world as they perceive it amongst their peers. So it's very varied, very um, diverse, but I think here in particular, we're responding constantly to the needs as they're presented by the young people. Um, there are some more formal uh, processes, so for example, uh, confirmation classes or first home communion classes, so supporting young people, whether that's them making that, uh, go to those classes in their parish or uh, with me in school, um, formally sort of looking at their faith, asking the big questions of life, uh, what sitting together as a group and really grappling with what does it look like to be, um, to go into my adult life or teenage, but to be an adult in the eyes of the church with a faith. How do I do this? How do I navigate the world with, uh, with my faith lens on? Um, so again, there's there might be a more formal sacramental process as well. But this is all based on the needs and the wants of the young people that they present themselves to us with. Do you know, te teaching's been very interesting. When I started, um, I studied with uh, CYM, when I started my uh, degrees, I was very adamant that I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, I've always worked in schools, supporting chaplaincy and supporting teachers in schools. Um, but I was very, I felt very different to teachers. I felt that my role complemented and supported teachers and, and that I could work with teachers to help that, uh, to help them support uh, the chaplaincy of the school, but I never felt that I would be one of them. Um, but uh, as we go through life, things, you know, different opportunities present themselves, and now I think it's more and more common that there will be these teaching chaplain roles. Um, and so, uh, 
the last couple of years I've applied for that. I don't have a PTCE, um, which is a teaching qualification. I work in an independent school and that isn't required in the same way that it is in state schools. Um, and it was a huge, um, a huge challenge. I feel like I use a very different part of my brain. I'm not sure, I'm not sure where, but I, I feel different when I'm in the classroom. I thought I would feel much more conflicted. I thought I would really, I, I thought I would be acting in the classroom and, and my, you know, self when I'm doing chaplaincy. But actually, and maybe that was the case in the beginning. Um, but as I've become more aware of the value of education in a faith, uh, in promotion of faith, um, actually that conflict isn't there in the same way. It's been interesting to be called Mrs. Walsh and um, to have a more formal relationship with pupils and to have to, you know, monitor um, have they handed in their homework, how are they doing academically. But actually, that hasn't. That hasn't stopped pupils coming to me, I don't think. I still have plenty at my door at lunchtime, I don't think I feel that that has become a barrier to my youth work. Um, if anything, I would say, in general, I know pupils better as a teacher. I don't just work with those who actually choose to come to the chaplaincy. I have a, a much greater reach because I have classes full of pupils. Um, so, it, is not, it has not been the challenge I thought it would be. Where, where there is tension is that, and uh, it's true, a teacher's job is never done. I am never as prepared as I want to be. I'm never up to date with my marking as I want to be. There is always more to do. And when I'm juggling these two roles, I have to say enough is enough for that one. I have to give my time to the other now and be very strict about that. But you know, at certain times of the year also, um, my chaplain role was spill out over into my teaching role and I'm having to ask for cover for my lessons. So it's just making sure that I balance those two roles and I don't give priority to, to one over the other all the time. I think you know, it has to be sort of quite distinct to ensure that both get my attention. Um, but it, it, it's interesting and I think this is going to be the norm for many chaplains potentially that there will be uh, a chaplain role but another, whether that's counsellor, whether you know, whatever that might be, a pastoral lead or something, it, it won't solely be chaplain, it will be chaplain and something else. So uh, June half or May half term, that is the time I sit down with the liturgical calendar for the next year and ensure that by the end of that term all of the liturgical events are in the school calendar first, then everything else fits around them. Um, because within the Catholic tradition there are such things as holy days of obligation, so days that we, we must have mass, we must stop our learning as a whole school community and come together for a service. Um, and these are sort of probably six times of the year, and sometimes we're not in school, so Ash Wednesday is an interesting one, sometimes we're in school and sometimes it's the February half term. Um, but we'll probably have yeah, five or six occasions where we stop, where the whole of the Catholic Church will stop at one point in the day and go to Mass. Um, we ensure that these things are in place. We look for creative ways in which the sacramental life can be celebrated. So, tutor group masses, for example, in, in the lunchtime, each tutor group has the opportunity to animate their own uh, mass. Um, they can read the gospel together, uh, uh, do, look at the, the music, um, prepare a, a welcome, um, create a beautiful centerpiece in front of the altar. We think we want to encourage creativity uh, within our masses and to, and to make that personal. They might want to get in touch with a priest and say, Father, we've read our, our gospel and, and we'd like you to talk about this with us. Could you, could you shed some light on this aspect or could you talk pastorally about this? Because this is something we're worried about or concerned about. That's particularly the case in year 11 when they're preparing for their GCSEs, for example. Um, but then there'll be other times, so um, Advent and Lent, for example, um, where it won't be a whole day of obligation, but we'll, we'll still think it's important to stop and have some meaningful experiences of faith together. So, um, reconciliation is something that's very important within the Catholic tradition. Now, that might look like the sacrament of reconciliation is in going to confession, but actually, um, for many in the school community, that is not something they wish to do. And um, having some sort of experiential um, 
an opportunity to reflect on, on your life, some of the challenges you might be experiencing. Um, are you happy with the direction you're going in? Do you perhaps want to uh, have a fresh start and to start again? Is there something you want to say sorry for, a bad habit that you keep on doing and you want to stop? Um, and we look for creative ways to offer students the opportunity to do that. So, for example, um, it, it is Advent now, and we've just had our Advent Reconciliation Service, and we have a reflection on um, the people and places associated with the Nativity. What do each of those people have to say to us about reconciliation, about faith, about trust in God? Um, we have that in here in the chapel, and then we go outside to the forest school area, we gather around the fire and students will have the opportunity to um, have an examination of conscience. So some questions asked of them about the Ten Commandments. Um, do they honour their father and mother? Do they lie to them? Do they deceive them? Do they respect and value them? Uh, do they make time for God? Uh, do they put other things in place of God? All of these types of questions. Um, they might write them down on a piece of paper and then we go to the fireside and then we place that piece of paper in the fire and then a reflection about the refiner's fire by taking on imperfections and leaving us uh, pure. So we look for creative ways in which students can experience the sacramental life and liturgical life of the school, no matter their faith tradition, their background, their knowledge. Um, it's something that everybody can experience in their own way, wherever they're at on their journey. So my background has been in uh, youth work and a large percentage of that uh, would be sort of detached youth work around the estates of Oxford. So having that as my background, my training, my, my foundation for formation, um, it's very hard to lose that um, when you come into a school context. Now, hanging around is not generally encouraged, uh, but actually when you carve out bits of time and look for opportunities, being around, available, um, is possible within a school day. So before school, for example, um, I make myself available for pupils and parents who are dropping students off to kind of have a quick word, or you know, if something's happened that morning, you can kind of see it on their face when they don't say good morning in the way that they would normally. Um, so being aware and looking out for these telltale signs of, of there being a need and being available to respond to that need. Um, so to not um, plan every moment of my day, but to look for these opportunities. You know, there's break times and lunch times, that's a given, but being out of my classroom or in the corridor at the change of lesson time, being around at the end of the day, being a part of the extracurricular clubs, just as a visitor to go and celebrate how well a young person's doing at their sport, for example, just, just being aware that um, around the school campus, there's a lot of opportunities to support, encourage, learn about what's important to the pupils um, and being there and being available. I will often have a door open, so even if I'm needing to do something, I can't sort of be out. Um, you sort of invite the outside in when that door is open, you listen out for what's said in the corridors and you can respond, not in a kind of cross way, but if you hear something that you think, oh, I need to, I want to, to question that, I want to understand what, what the upset is there, you can respond to that. So just having a, a mind to always be available where possible. Um, I have a place I hide so that when I can't do that, when I really do need to focus on something if there's a deadline or something really has to be done, I can go and hide somewhere. Um, but I try and be as available as I can be at every moment that I can. Brilliant. And you're not just chaplain to the students, yeah. but you're chaplain to staff and have a role with staff and senior leaders. Yeah. Tell us about that. So the openness of staff to receive the support of a chaplain is very interesting. Um, if there's been a long history of chaplaincy within a school, then I, I have experienced staff to be very open and sort of know how to use that service. But if it's a relatively new thing, um, I, think, I think people need to know how they can access what there is on offer and how they can access it. Because they, their gut instinct is, you're there for the pupils, but actually very often within the job description of a, a school chaplain, um, it will say the pastoral care of staff as well. 
So having some uh, opportunities that are specific for staff was one way in which I communicated that. So staff morning prayer in the chapel, for example, they know that that is just for them. Um, getting alongside and being friends and caring about their lives. So when somebody has a baby sending a card, uh, when somebody um, has had a promotion celebrating it with them. So again, being very aware of what's going on, what you can pick up in the staff room and being and communicating that care to teachers in the same way that you might do to pupils, not to be afraid of that. It takes a while. Um, I think adults are harder than pupils to connect with sometimes and maybe uh, there's a, a, a bit of suspicion about the faith dynamic with which you might be approaching things, you know, is there a, an agenda to that conversation? But it's, it's about sharing who you are, um, but also caring about who they are as well, and, uh, and letting that, letting them know that. So sitting, sitting with them at lunchtime as well sometimes, having teas and coffees in the staff room sometimes, but being available for staff as much as you are available for pupils as well. Uh, interestingly, at this school, it's the chaplain that is also the social sec. Now, I don't know how this role came about, but I'm the person that um, organises the gifts and presents, um, and, and also the Christmas parties and the summer um, parties as well. And I think that's a really lovely thing. It shows that I don't just care, uh, you know, about things that happen in this chapel, but also care about us as a, uh, us as a school community having fun together as well. So if there's a role in which uh, you can especially be available to start and, and care broadly about well-being, that, that would be a good thing as well. Now, um, within the Birmingham March Diocese, which is the diocese in which this school uh, is in, um, there is a phrase that is often used, sort of drilled into this chaplain, that we are the prophetic voice uh, within the school, and sometimes we have to have very difficult, challenging conversations with the leaders. Now this can be extremely difficult, especially if you're establishing yourself um, or the role uh, new in a school, but to, um, to not be afraid to do that, to trust that God gives you these messages, um, these, these things, whether that's um, you hear his voice or feel the kind of draw somewhere or you feel just within yourself something that's not right, uh, to have the courage to, and the means by which to go and speak to somebody about it to pray about it first and to uh, know that God is with you in that and to show that person that actually what's at the heart of this is the well-being of the school community as a whole. Uh, it's not you just being difficult or wanting to be, uh, wanting to have, um, I don't know, sort of more faith opportunities in the school but actually there is something not right here. I feel it in, in my gut and I'm going to communicate that to the staff. And, uh, and within time, I think, as, as you develop your role, you'll be a trusted person, somebody that uh, people will listen to. So there's a sort of uh, inner wisdom that uh, will come from faith and maybe not uh, reflected in your age, but uh, you, you'll become known as somebody who has something worthwhile to say and uh, the courage to go and have those difficult conversations. So I'd, I'd encourage you in that.